Well, brothers and sisters, good morning. Good morning. Oh, it is a beautiful day, is it not? Oh, it is gorgeous. We are so blessed to have days like this. Well, folks, uh, in case you were wondering why I didn't make my usual rounds and say hey to everybody, I bragged for two weeks that I wasn't going to get Jackie and my boys sickness, and then that bragging <coughs> caught on to me, and I'm starting to get something. So I ain't sharing the love with everybody. So good morning. Grace and peace to all of you. So glad to see you on this beautiful day. A few announcements this morning. If I can remember them off the top of my head, we do have a fellowship meal this Wednesday. Sign-up sheets are out there on the bulletin. And then we also have a blueberry pound cake out there, courtesy of Atina. So you know that's going to be just amazing. So if you want some of that after service, make sure you go out there and get some. And... I think that's about it, unless anyone else has any asthmas. Go for it. It's that time again, Easter egg hunt, and it'll be uh, April 1st from 2 to 4, so if you can be at the store and see some candy, we would appreciate that, and plastic eggs would be wonderful. I have some in the trunk of my car, <laughs> because I've been getting some every week, but um, yeah, we're going to do that. Yeah. It is. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Easter will be here before we know it. So come on and get some eggs, get some candy. Uh, the other announcement is hopefully Sunday school will start back next week. I'm not going to, we're not going to have it today just as are under the weather and stuff like that. So, but other than that, folks, is there any further announcements that I'm missing? No? Okay. Well, brothers and sisters, let's begin today's beautiful worship service. Please open your The Faith We Sing hymnal to number 2023, and let us stand and praise God by singing, How Majestic Is Your Name.
Beautiful. Well, brothers and sisters, our greeting this morning, Lord, may we be faithful witnesses to you by living according to your word. Lord, may our labor for you be fruitful by sharing the good news with everyone. And let us say our opening prayer together. Compassionate God, your love extends to the whole world. Open our eyes to the suffering of your people everywhere and give us the courage to make their needs our own. Walk with us every day and send us to do your work in joy and thanksgiving. Amen. Well, folks, you may be seated as we take a center a minute to center our lives for worship this morning. Today, we move along to a joyful witness, how we live our lives, not just in here, but primarily when we leave this place, how we live our lives, how we witness to our faith. And that can mean you actually, you know, sharing your faith with somebody, but a lot of times it can be just by your actions. It can be your attitude, how you go through life. You know, as Christians, we are pulled in two different directions a lot of times. You know, we, we all want to go to heaven, right? I don't think there's anyone in here that don't want to go to heaven. We want to go to heaven. But there's a lot of stuff in life that holds our appeal too, right? It reminds me of a story I heard. There was a children's Sunday school teacher and she was teaching about heaven, and at the end of the Sunday school lesson, she asked all the children, who wants to go to heaven? Raise your hand. And all of them raised their hand real high except one little boy. And she asked, well, Johnny, how come you don't want to go to heaven? You didn't raise your hand. And little Johnny said, well, after church, Mom promised we're going to McDonald's. <laughs> That's big stuff, right? You know, I think a lot of us can feel like that. We, we have things we look forward to in life, and we don't need to feel guilty for enjoying life. You know, we have things we enjoy, marriage, family, you know, a fulfilling job, travel, vacations, you know, recreation. All these things have a legitimate appeal, folks. But if the delights of our earthly home are so attractive that we start losing sight of God's purpose for putting us here, then we start running into a problem. And that's what we're going to talk about today, is we're going to talk about taking the everyday things in life, especially those things you hold dear, your family, your career, vacations, hobbies, whatever it is. We're going to talk about how you can transform those into everyday witnessing opportunities. So with that, we got this little circle up here, and it's nice and big for everyone to see. Because it can roll off your tongue real fast. And this is what I want you to remember as we go through worship today. Care, dare, share, prayer. And dare is in the middle. Because we can share with people, we can care about people, we can pray about people, but do you dare to do it? Because caring is showing concern for other people. And then sharing involves sharing your life with somebody, giving them your all. Okay? And then, of course, we all know what prayer is, and we pray for our neighbor. But do you dare to do it? Do you dare to be so vulnerable that you can share who you are with somebody else? When you leave this place and you go out, you know, Monday through Saturday, do you dare enough to be that Christian witness? Well, just remember, care, dare, share, prayer. Care, dare, share, pray. Roll off the tongue real good. You remember those four things, and you apply it to your life, your personality. You do that, and you'll start finding witnessing opportunities all the time, folks. And it won't be so scary anymore, and it won't be so daring anymore, because that sharing and caring is going gonna, is gonna to take everything. So, folks, just remember that today. As we go through worship, care, dare, share, prayer. And with that, brothers and sisters, this time open your hymnal to number 617. And if you're able, please rise and let us praise God by singing the first verse and the fifth verse 
of I Come With Joy, number 617. Good and gracious Lord, we praise you for this day. It is an absolutely beautiful day, Lord. Let it be a reminder that you have given us so many good and precious gifts. So Lord, let us take these gifts. Let us share them with our neighbors, with the community. Let your love be shown through our lives. And Lord, I pray that you take our tithes and offerings and you multiply them for your kingdom purpose. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, now we have that time where we get to share our prayers and our praises with one another. A wonderful and joyous time to whatever's been laying on your heart to open your heart up with everyone else. So I'm just going to start. Uh, you know, there's sickness going around. I got it too. I ain't, we ain't never been so sick like this. It's one thing after another for like three months. It's crazy. But we're not the only ones either. So anyone who's sick, family members, friends, co-workers, just keep them all in your prayers because it has been a rough year for sickness. And then I'm sure most of you know, but Barbara made it home from her surgery, and she is doing good. She was in a little bit of pain, but I think she's getting better every single day. And she wanted me to tell all of you thank you for your caring, for your prayers. And she can't wait to get back here and, and see y'all smiling faces again. So keep praying for Barbara for that fast and strong recovery. And she'll be back here before you know it. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to all of you. Karen has a microphone. Just raise your hand if you have a praise or a prayer request today.
Keep Marcus in your prayers. He went back to the doctor on Friday. It was supposed to be just his checkup, but he'd been having some more problems, and they're going to do another CT scan. They're afraid he might have more clots, so just keep him in your prayers. We sure will. Thank you, Jeff. So this is um, more of an announcement, but everybody keeps saying, are we going to have a yard sale? So I guess I'm going to throw my hat in the ring. We're going to have one, and, and y'all know this is a big project, and so I'm going to be contacting every, everybody's going to have a job because Cindy and I are going to be gone part of the time during prep. So, but anyway, start cleaning out your drawers, cleaning out all that stuff, but everybody's, it's going to be a group project, and I'll be contacting everybody. So first weekend, first Friday and Saturday in May. So First Friday and Saturday in May. All right. Uh, I noticed that uh, on Facebook, uh, Cassie and Cody are on vacation, so let's keep them in their prayers for their travels. Yep, traveling mercies. Hope they make some good memories. That's right, that's important. Thank you, Al. <clears throat> Angela Guffey has the flu. Yes, she does. Thank you, Cindy. Yep, it's not fun having the flu. There's never a good time for the flu. There's just not. Well, we pray she feels better soon. Any more praises or prayer requests? All righty. Well, brothers and sisters, we'll have our silent moment of prayer time, and then I'll lead us in prayer. So let us pray. Well, Lord Almighty, we thank you for this beautiful day that you have made. We thank you for the, remi for the reminders of, of new life that is springing all around us, for the beauty of each individual flower and tree and the green grass. Just, you are the almighty designer. So, Lord, let us take some time today to stand in awe of all that you have made. And then to sit there and ponder to ourselves that you wanted us as well. That you love us. That you sent your son for us. So Lord, in all of this grand design that we gaze at our windows and, and look at, you love us more and more. Lord, I pray that it fills our hearts with joy and gladness. That the, crea the creator of heaven and earth will also shape and mold us. So Lord, I pray that we come to a place where we can be shaped by you. Where you will mold us individually and as a church to resemble what you would have us to look like. To do what you would have us to do. To be fellow servants going out into the fields and continuing your work. So, Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit overflows in each person here today. That the realness of you, that, that your love, that your caring, that your mercy is made known to us in a whole new way. 
For Lord, you come to each of us in our times of need. You are never far away from us. And we come to you each in our own way. So Lord, I pray that all the silent prayers are loud upon your ears. That in your own time and according to your will that you answer our requests. That you fill us with joy and gladness to go out and to not only share the gospel with our words, but to go out and share the gospel with our very lives. That people will know exactly who our Savior is just by our actions, the way we conduct ourselves, the joy we have when we come together for fellowship, and the Spirit that fills and unites all of us. Lord, I pray that that Spirit will be outpoured throughout not only this community, but the world. So, Lord, let there never be a task set before us that we fear is too big or that we're unequipped for. But open our eyes to see you, to see you in a whole new way. Lord, we will overcome because we know you have overcome. So whatever our prayer requests are today or throughout this week, for health or healing, for questions to be answered, whatever they may be, we lay them at your feet, Lord, fully trusting in you. And as we share in Holy Communion in a little bit, let your spirit be more alive than ever in this place. Bring us together in a whole new way. And as we go forward from this day, I pray that you lead us, guide us, and that you would make this church what you would have it to be, that for centuries to come, because Lord, we're going to think big, for centuries, generations to come, your will will be done in this place, and everyone will know that good Christians, people who Sacrifice all to love you and to share your word, have worshipped here, and will continue to build this place up so this community can be built up for your glory. So Lord, I pray that throughout this coming week and months and whatever the rest of this year brings, that the new life and the beauty we see today will stay with us for eternity and will always motivate us to be joyful witnesses. Because you came to serve and not just be served. Give us that spirit as well. In Jesus' name, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Today, Cameron is going to fill in for Barbara and read today's scripture. Today we have Philippians 1, 12 through 26. Brothers and sisters, I want you to know that the things that have happened to me have actually advanced the gospel. The whole Praetorian Guard and everyone else knows that I'm in the prison for Christ. Most of the brothers and sisters have had more confidence through the Lord to speak the word boldly and bravely because of my jail time. Some certainly preach Christ with jealous and competitive motives, but others preach with good motives. They are motivated by love because they know that I'm here to put a defense of the gospel. The others preach Christ because of their selfish ambition. They are insincere, hoping to cause me more pain while I'm in prison. What do I think about this? Just this, since Christ is proclaimed in every possible way, whether from dishonest or true motives, I'm glad and I'll continue to be glad. I'm glad because I know that this will result in my release through the prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. It is my expectation and hope that I won't be put to shame in anything. Rather, I hope with daring courage that Christ's greatness will be seen in my body now as always, whether I live or die. Because for me, living serves Christ and dying is even better. If I continue to live in this world, I get results from my work. But I don't know what I prefer. I'm torn between the two because I want to leave this life and be with Christ, which is far better. However, it's more important for me to stay in this world for your sake. I'm sure of this. I will stay alive and remain with all of you to help your progress and the joy of your faith. And to increase your pride in Christ Jesus through my presence when I visit you again. Well, folks, <clears throat> all of us at times have given other people directions. You know, someone comes up to you and asks, where's Walmart, where's Food Line, where's this, where's that, where's that? And we'll help them out. When someone is lost and they come to you for a direction, it's not intimidating to help them out because first, you know the way, and second, they came to you. You know, you know, you might even feel some joy because you were able to help that person. But now, if you flip that entire situation around, most likely you will feel intimidated. I mean, if you go up to a stranger and out of the blue just start giving them directions to Walmart, you're going to get some funny looks. You know, if they didn't ask for directions, if they don't need directions, but you just start going up and telling them this is what you do. <coughs> You're going to get some funny looks. Might even get said something to you. I don't know. You know, folks, we tend to figure that if people need help, then they will reach out. If they're lost, they'll reach out. If they need a church, they'll reach out. If they desire to become a Christian, they'll reach out. But when it comes to people's eternal well-being, you can never sit around and just hope that people will reach out. To truly love your neighbor, which is anybody that you happen to be around at any given time, you must care for their temporary condition as well as their eternal condition. To care for your neighbor's temporary condition is to give them their daily bread. It is to both give them a fish and to teach them how to fish. But if all we do is stop right here and worry about their temporary condition, then we are being arrogant, we're being unloving. Their daily bread will not do anything when they have reached the end of their days. You know, Jesus didn't come so our bellies could be full. Jesus didn't come so that we would have a place to lay our head at night. Jesus didn't have a place to lay his head at night. Instead, he puts it this way. Jesus said... The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus was a man 
on a mission. He had a purpose, and even from a young age, Jesus knew that he must be about his father's business. And to do this, folks, Christ met unbelievers where they were. Jesus realized what many Christians today still don't seem to understand, and that is to work a field, you must get out in the field. And according to one account, if you open up the four Gospels, you will see how there is 132 times that Jesus had contact with people. 132 times Jesus had contact with people. Six were in the temple, four were in the synagogues, and 122 were out with the people in the mainstream of everyday life. As members of the way, you have been commanded by Christ to continue his ministry by being witnesses to the world, by going out into the fields of life and giving directions to the lost. But this can be as intimidating as going up to a stranger and telling them how to get to Walmart. And sadly, far too often, we tend to shy away from our God-given duty. You know, sharing your faith can be scary, so where's the joy in that? Well, you know, folks, we come up with a lot of excuses so we don't have to face this head on. You know, maybe there's people out there who say, I don't need to impose my faith on somebody, so they just ain't going to share their faith. Or, you know, maybe that person's not lost. Maybe someone else will talk to them about Jesus. Maybe they're in a hurry. I don't want to bother them right now. You know, or you might even be thinking something like, well, you know, being a witness for Christ should probably be better suited for, you know, an actual trained evangelist. You know, someone like the late Billy Graham. You know, and, and we ain't no Billy Graham in here. You know, after all, who am I to witness for Christ? You know, who am I? You know, this little old me. Who is Justin? to witness for Christ? What could I possibly have to say? What could you possibly have to say to witness for Christ? Well, folks, you don't have to be a Billy Graham. You don't have to be a professional evangelist or anything like that because every believer is a born-again child of God. And brothers and sisters, if that does not give you joy, then we better re-examine our faith because I pray that that gives you joy that you are a child of God. And being a child of God, that means that you have the Holy Spirit living within you, and it provides you the power, the courage, whatever is needed to get out into the fields of life and to start cultivating. Now, over the centuries, what has happened as being a witness for Christ has become synonymous with, like, missionaries, people who go overseas and they risk their lives for their faith, because the Greek word for witness is a word we all know very well, and that is martyr, someone who dies for their faith. So when it comes to intentionally sharing our faith, we tend to see other people do it. Missionaries, these professional evangelists, you know, maybe even some of those people that you see on TV. They have these great worldwide ministries, and they can bring multitudes to Christ. Well, that's fine and dandy, but they can't reach the people that you can reach because they're not following you around 24-7. You can be an evangelist. You can joyfully witness. What you got to do, though, is you got to intentionally go out into the mission fields because the mission fields of life are not just left to those people we consider so skilled professionals. No. Intentionally going out into the mission fields, well, it's become the job of skilled professionals, not everyday believers. That's what we try to tell ourselves. Someone else can do it. Someone with more schooling or better with words, something like that. But folks, that could not be further from the truth. Because every moment of your Christian life is spent on the mission field. Now, the enemy, the father of lies, would have you to believe that the mission field is a distant place, somewhere that you must go to, when in fact the mission field is the everyday ground that you and I walk on. Every second of your life is an opportunity to either like 
the Christian faith or live the Christian faith. And there is a big difference in that. Your life is a sermon preached daily in which you can either stand on the mission field and watch or you can cultivate the field by representing who your Savior is. Because, brothers and sisters, missions begin right here at home, right here on your very doorstep. Whatever life situation you find yourself in, like Paul in today's scripture, you have an opportunity to witness for Christ. And don't think that you can't do it because you'll just get it wrong, okay? I once heard of a barber who was saved Sunday morning at church. And he was filled with the Spirit. He was on fire for the Lord. And he wanted to share his new faith with the lost. So the next day, Monday rolled around and he's at work and a customer came in. And he was all on fire. I got to share Jesus with this guy. And the customer sat in the chair and the barber began to shave him. And he was trying to muster up the courage to find the right words to say. And finally, as he stood with the razor poised over the man's throat, he said, are you prepared to meet God? (laughs) Brothers and sisters, as funny as that is, you ain't got to worry about something like that happening to you. Because if you are going to have a divine opportunity to share your faith, which can happen anywhere, anytime, any place, with anyone around, you might think what you're going to say is going to just be taken the whole wrong way. But folks, trust me, in fact, better yet, trust God, that if you have the opportunity, then don't let anything stand in your way for being a joyful witness for Christ. You might not have a razor blade at another guy's throat, but folks, you don't need that. All you need is to share yourself with the other person. You're not going to mess up. And if you do, so what? Because it's like Paul says in today's scripture, at least Christ was preached. As funny as it might be and as bad a job as you think you could have done, at least Christ was was preached. You did something about it. You'll feel good about yourself, folks. You are going to like that. So folks, don't don't allow worry to muffle your mouth or shy away from situations. The Bible says the Holy Spirit will give you the words to speak. So in any situation you find yourself in, trust in God that that divine opportunity to share your faith The Holy Spirit will give you the words to speak. And I pray that you believe that and that it moves you to action. You don't have to have everything planned in advance. You don't have to have the answers to potential questions. All you have to do is be willing and have faith. Paul showed this in today's scripture. In fact, throughout his whole Christian life, he showed this. Because Paul used everything in this life two point to the next. He used everything on this side of eternity to teach about the other side of eternity. Paul even used being locked up in prison. So, you know, the same God who used Moses' rod, Gideon's pitchers, and David's sling has now used Paul's chains. The chains that the Romans used to bind Paul did not bind the gospel. Now, any one of us might feel depressed, discouraged, just a whole host of emotions if we were sitting in jail because of our faith. But not Paul, because his chains gave him contact with the lost. It provided opportunities. Now, back then, folks, when you were chained up like Paul was, he was also chained to a Roman soldier. And a Roman soldier would be chained to him 24 hours a day, And what the Roman soldiers would do is they would have six-hour shifts. So you're going to be chained to Paul for six hours. After six hours, someone else is going to relieve you. You know, a Roman soldier would change every six hours. But you know what it did for Paul? It gave Paul the opportunity to witness to at least four people a day. That's the way he saw it. But you know, then, just as today, we tend to see chains as something negative. People are chained to various things in life like drugs, alcohol, lust, regret of their past, fear of the future, maybe some nagging sin that you just can't get rid of. 
There are a million things that you might feel chained to. But being a joyful witness is singing songs about being a chain breaker, emphasizing the freedom found in Christ. And this is what Paul was getting at in verse 19 when he said, For, th for I know that through your prayers and God's provision, that the Spirit of Jesus Christ, that what has happened to me will actually turn out for my deliverance. Through your prayers, so corporately, through your prayers and God's provision, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. Now, there's one word I want to focus on here, folks, and that is that word provision. So, underline it, circle it, whatever you got to do, because provision means supply. And it is where we get our English word chorus from. Your prayers are part of God's provision in which our witness for Christ should be like a joyful song sung together for God's glory. God's provision through your prayers should be like a joyful song sung for, for God's glory. So folks, don't ever let your witness be bound by chains because as Paul would say in 2 Timothy 2 verse 9, God's word is not chained. If anyone knew that better than anyone else, it was certainly Paul. Witness to the power of Christ, brothers and sisters, and rejoice at what God is going to do instead of being stuck and complaining about what God didn't do. Paul's chains not only provided contact with the lost, but it provided countless people the courage to become saved. Now, I want you to think of this, folks. During Paul's imprisonment, he not only got to witness to the guards, and by doing that, he brought the gospel to the center of Rome. But think of this, folks. The time that Paul was in chains gave Paul the time to write numerous letters that you and I read in the New Testament today. Think about that. Paul was chained up witnessing to the Roman guards, but he also spent time writing the letters that you and I read today. So brothers and sisters, you never know how your witness today can impact a future full of tomorrows. Don't let any opportunity slip by. Today's scripture teaches us how Paul's circumstances were not as important as what he did with them. How you and I act in all of life situations will reflect what you and I believe. You know, discouragement has a way of spreading but so does encouragement. So let's encourage one another. You know, but sometimes the chains that are trying to bind you, those things that you feel chained to, those chains are not the only things that's in trying to steer your joy. You might feel chained to, like I said, this nagging sin or something that you just feel you can't get rid of, but there's other things that try to steer your joy. Because outside of Paul's prison, outside of where Paul was chained up to, there were people out there preaching Christ in a manner to harm Paul. You know, some pre preached Christ in hopes that Paul's imprisonment would become worse. Others preached Christ in a way to mock Paul, to make fun of him. But either way, it didn't matter to Paul just as long as Christ was preached. It didn't matter to him if he was being made fun of. And, you know, that got me to thinking how envy and strife can go together, but love and unity can also go together. Joy can easily become lost on the mission field of life if your focus is always on yourself and not on the chain breaker. When evangelism centers on the evangelist, we will lose sight of the joy of the gospel. There's a great example of this, and it's... Uh, Two very great English evangelists. One is John Wesley and the other is George Whitfield. I don't know if you heard of them before. I'm sure you have. But they disagreed on many doctrinal matters. They preached together. But then behind closed doors, they, they disagreed a whole bunch. But you know, both of them, they preached to tens of thousands of people. And they saw multitudes upon multitudes come to Christ. 
And one day is reported that somebody went up to John Wesley and asked him if he expected to see George Whitfield in heaven. And John Wesley replied, nope, I don't. And this surprised the reporter. And he said, well, then you don't think Whitfield is a converted man? Oh, of course he's a converted man, Wesley said. But I don't expect to see him in heaven because he will be so close to the throne of God and I so far away that I will not be able to see him. You see, brothers and sisters, everything that happens in life, and we can learn this from Paul, can be an opportunity to either get down in the dumps or to be a joyful witness. There, there's a balancing act here. Like I said, in Center Knowledge Worship, we can be pulled in multiple different directions. Okay? For these two English evangelists, they could have argued, they could have not preached together. That wouldn't have done anybody any good. Instead, they decided to work together because Christ was preached. And that is what Paul is trying to get at us today. That Christ is preached and that is what's, what matters. You will have differences with people, folks. If you don't know that by now, I'm sorry. I'm sure you know it already. You're going to have differences with people. That's because also love is a choice. It's not just a feeling. You have differences with people, but what are you going to do with it? Are you going to harbor that? Hold a grudge, not witness, not be the Christian you should be? Are you going to envy somebody? Or are you going to flip that around and live as what Paul is trying to teach us? And that is to use every day and every situation for God's glory. You know, even though they had differences, Wesley did not hold any envy in his heart, nor did he speak to oppose Whitfield's ministry. So folks, whether you are chained up or not... Criticism can be hard to take, especially during difficult circumstances. So, whether you're like that barber holding the knife to the guy's throat, or whether you're at work, or whether you're at Walmart, or at Food Line, wherever you're at, you ain't got to criticize people. You ain't got to look at someone and go, what's wrong with them? Instead, flip the script and be that joyful witness. Because no matter what happens in life, and it can be easy to say, but hard to do, no matter what happens in life, Scripture says that Paul continued to rejoice because Christ was preached. Paul was sitting in jail, chained up, but he was still full of joy. That is an amazing faith right there, amen? Amen. That's a faith all of us should strive after, amen? Amen. Not only that, but towards the end of today's Scripture, he was torn should I go to heaven or should I stay here and help these people? I love God. I want to go to heaven. But I love these people. And I want to make more people come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Even then, he was torn. So if you feel your life being torn in different directions, folks, maybe that is God trying to tell you something. Maybe that is God planting a seed inside of you saying, hey, there's a field that you can cultivate. So look inside. Look inside of yourself. Because as we see in today's scripture, it is because of Paul, Paul's chains that Christ was known. It is because of Paul's critics that Christ was preached. And it was because of Paul's crisis that Christ was magnified. Serving alongside Christ by continuing his ministry through the power of the Holy Spirit will bring you to a joyful witness. Now, you might not feel like you can magnify Christ, because after all, that's what we're talking about. When you are a joyful witness, when you are sharing your faith, when you are living gospel lives, when you are being that kingdom person, you might not feel like you can magnify Christ, but in reality, that's what we're doing. We are magnifying Christ with our lives. And if you don't feel that you can do that, I assure you, you can. So I want you to think of it like this. If it's a clear night tonight, go outside and look up at the stars for a minute. That never gets old, right? Go outside and look up at the stars for a minute. And think to yourself how the stars are much bigger than a telescope. Yet a telescope magnifies them and brings them closer. So if you have a telescope, use one. But you know, your life 
your mission field, your witness, is to be a telescope that brings Jesus Christ closer to people. Now, those who don't believe in Christ, life on earth is all there is, so it is going to be natural for them to strive for worldly values, such as money, popularity, power, pleasure, all these things, and they will become angry when, when one of these is taken away or reduced. Trials impede their way of life instead of empowering their witness. But folks, but as the unsaved watch you, a believer, go through a chain full trial, I pray that they can see Jesus Christ magnified in your life and brought closer by your witness. To the believer, Christ is with us in the here and now. Jesus is always with us. But to the unbeliever, Jesus isn't very big. Other things, other people seem to be more important. But a telescope brings distant things closer. As others watch your Christian witness, they should be able to see how big Jesus Christ really is. The believer's body is a lens that makes a little Christ look very big and a distant Christ come very close. May all of you feel the closeness of Christ as together we partake of Holy Communion. And may the closeness of Christ at the communion table be your joyful witness to a watching world. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, with that, I ask that you open your hymnal to page 12, A Service of Word and Table. And Ronald, if you would come forward, please. Brothers and sisters, like I said, since I am a little under the weather, I figure I don't need to be touching your piece of bread and sharing the love in that way. So Ronald was nice enough to volunteer to come up and do this. So thank you, Ronald. I'm going to get this too. That, and it's hard to do with this, so... I'm still going to use the hand sanitizer, though. Okay. Well, brothers and sisters, page 12, a service of word and table. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, 
This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen.
Well, brothers and sisters, now that you are spiritually fed, I pray that you will have a joyful witness throughout today, this coming week, throughout your whole life for that matter. So folks, go out and preach Christ. That is our prayer for today. We are going to change our final hymn, so I ask if you can please stand and open your hymnal to number 572, and we are going to praise God on this beautiful day by singing Pass it on, number 572. 